Welcome, Sojourners. You have found yourself a cozy place here at Sojourners Awake. I'm Jonathan, and this is our production of The Bookish and the Brave. Like you, the Sojourners are on a mission, and they face conflict and sometimes even danger. Follow along with Vaughn, Hawkins, and Sterling as they move through the revolutionized city of Boshan one year later after they fled the burning, the execution, and the extraction of the noble families. Now within the city and a new regime, they hunt down the Amberdoon gang, who are reportedly creating Gingwatsums, books full of evil spirits who do nothing but siphon off the life of those who read its contents. And in this episode, they finally reach the Amberdoon gang. And of course, not without incident. And so for now, our story continues. Finally, the sojourners gathered together in the busy city of Boshan. Vaughn and Hawkins, having bartered with the Grove Lord dwarves, teleported into the city of flame. To the surprise of guards and the arcanists, the two sojourners arrived, disguised as dwarves, and claiming to have pass cards to move into the city. The guards pressed them for more information until feigning looking into his pouch, Hawkins pushed Vaughn into a guard, pretending to argue. In this distraction, the two compatriots rushed out of the city square, locking the guards within the interrogation room. Vaughn and Hawkins rushed into the city square, and all the while, Sterling managed to learn Abyssal, study demon anatomy, and learn a new spell all under the tutelage of Yasbro, the necromancer of Merkelism. Now Sterling found his friends and finally reconnected with them after three days in Boshan, and three days of being alone. Since the sojourners reunited, they decided to duck out of the upper city as soon as possible to avoid capture, but confident that the guards would be looking for two bumbling dwarves. The sojourners hijacked a troubadour carriage and led them far away from prying eyes and into the slums of the outer city. Arriving in the town of Twinville by night, they entered the only open building right before Hawkins augmented his physics at an impressive seven feet tall. And within the tavern, they take a seat as bloodshot eyes peer on and drunken mouths mutter curses. And so for now, our story continues. It is nighttime within the seedy tavern. Evidence of terrible food, cheap ale, and a skulking figure eyeing you in the corner. The barkeep goes about dragging out drunkards, people who are passed out. Hawkins, you're definitely getting a, a couple of glances. You, Sterling, you catch a couple of lips muttering with your observant features, reading their lips. And someone says, if that's not the tallest gnome I've ever seen, then Bane will have my head. You see a couple of red handprints on the wall with the scrawlings, the sons of war. And as the three of you sit in this tavern, how do you proceed? Vaughn is going to stand up and um, make his way to the outdoors to use the restroom. And uh, as he steps outside, he's going to um, he's going to reach into his pocket and he's going to pull out his mom's ring. And uh, looking over the river, He's, uh, he's going to just start talking to her. He says, uh, Mom, uh, things are so different. I'm glad you're not here. I even had to go to the abyss to move our mission forward. No wonder they say bookends don't last very long. It was scary. But we were able to come back through a portal with a dwarf we met named Valinia. Uh, she took us to Grovelor, 
and we met some wonderful dwarfs there. But I was so overwhelmed, I, I don't think I even really took it in. I even forgot what my dwarf friend uh, Phineas told me about Kunslinkin. I made such a fool of myself. I'm glad he wasn't there to hear me. It's a good thing Hawkins was there to help me. Oh, Kunslinkin is a dwarven word. It, it means resilience or, or, or fire in the belly. Uh, you didn't know that probably, but uh, I don't really feel that way right now. But we met the old dwarf. His name is Garandan, and, and he, he seems to be famous, uh, at least among the dwarfs. But uh, we learned that he redeems souls. That's why we were in the abyss. Uh, kind of like I used to redeem the poor and needy in Boshan. Oh, I guess you really didn't know about that, did you? Well, we were able to teleport from Grovelor back to Boshan. But, well, you remember where the teleportation circle is, and the Bay Knights, uh, those are the bad guys. They control the portal now. Hawkins and I went in disguise, trying to look like dwarves. <laughs> Myself and a gnome trying to look like dwarves, but uh, it worked. We fooled the guards, uh, and Hawkins created a diversion for us to get out. So we escaped, and no one died. That was nice, but they don't like nobles and they're all looking for me. We found Sterling, he's our other companion. Uh, and he was hanging out with a demon named Yarsborough. I don't understand that guy. I'm not sure why he's always taken in these creatures, people, but uh, well, we needed to leave town, and because everybody's looking for me, we, Hawkins arranged a ride with a caravan of traveling performers. That was a strange experience. So many new experiences, and they took us all the way to the far side of the outer city, but we were able to get out. And the demon guy left, so that was good. I'm thankful. When I finally got to talk to Sterling, he gave me this ring, your ring. And he said he saw Chathy. Well, we decided to head to Twainville uh, to continue on our mission. We had to help up some farmers on the way. Uh, there was a big ant monster that uh, was causing problems, but we were able to help. And then in Slaughterton, there were so many signs and so many people talking about how much they hate the nobles. We weren't all bad, Mom. Some of us were good. I'm so sad about what has become of our once proud city. Well, I better get back in before I miss you. And then he'll kiss the ring, put it in his pocket and head back inside. Sit down with the guys. And in the background, as Vaughn kisses the ring, there's a single silhouette of a fisherman humming a song. The stars smile on me. The luck of love is with me tonight. The fish are biting, and I'll not be fighting with the love of my life. And as this door closes behind you, you hear the moaning and the groaning and the creaking of rotten wood. Sterling and Hawkins are sitting upon the table. Hawkins isn't paying much attention to what's going on around him. He's mostly oblivious to the stares and comments that he's getting. He's just kind of um, absorbed in the meal. Um, he maybe even pulls out his journal to write a bit uh, to recap the day. And Sterling will look at Hawkins. Hey, it's a good thing you're big because because now you can protect yourself because I don't see that lion with you. And he was always there to take care of you. Is that why you're big? 
He went into the abyss after you. Do you know where he went? I think I heard that there was a uh, some kind of mechanism built into him that he would go back to my parents' house if uh, if I got separated from him on a different plane. So I imagine that's where he went, and that's just as well. That way we could drop him off, return him to my parents without uh, without having to see them. That would have been great to see them. Oh my goodness, they would be so proud of where you've come and you know all your doings in Bold Top. But, but okay, 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 that makes sense. Uh, uh, you think they're worried about you? No, I doubt it. They, uh, I mean, they don't. As long as I don't bring them shame, they're pretty much leave me to myself. So, you hear a sniveling voice behind you. He pulls up a chair and you see this ratty old man with overgrown facial hair and a red bandana. You want to make mom and dad proud? Well, pardon me, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. It's the only coherent one currently going on. Are you interested in making a little money well, during your stay here in Twainville? My strong friends and we're not planning to stay here too long i don't think it's a quick and easy job high paying we need to get rest tonight we've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow i yeah. suppose we could hear you but i Seeing don't know that, that we're gonna spend any time doing except what we came here to do well, seeing that as an invitation, he places 200 gold upon the table. There's a court appearance tomorrow. A man named Tavit, who is supposedly working as a fisher. We just need someone to testify honestly, two or three witnesses, that he is a noble class in the sky. This would, of course, enact the law currently that every noble within Boshan <laughs> has no rights to land by order of Lord Basile in the Sons of War. It's perfectly legal during this time, but we've had a hard time connecting the dots. So, having stepped into the seedy tavern, you look about you and see that there is not a honorable a reputable person within here. Assuming you have associated yourself with low lives, criminals, and thieves, rather than the honest fisher folk within Twainville, this skulking man looks to you with a greedy eye and opens the gold purse to show you the demonstration of 200 gold and awaits your response. We will not be here tomorrow morning. Sorry we can't help. Well, it's not the kind of work for everyone. Takes the gold and walks out of the tavern. I'm glad I didn't do what I wanted to do. Yeah, the abyss must have really changed you. Not too much, Sterling. You be careful. The night presses on deep into the dawn. Four o'clock, five o'clock comes sleep begins to take you whether you press on towards the serpent bridge where the supposed amber dune hideout is located or whether you choose to stay here and rest it's completely up to you i think we need to rest but looking around i don't know that this is the place that we'll find that rest i mean i'm sure if we got a room no one would bother us don't you think the barkeep comes over at that moment so Nobody's allowed to sleep here at the tables. I'm closing down the bar, finally. Are you gonna have a room? Or you'll be sleeping in the manure? Well, when you put it that way, I think we'll have a room. Fine, hand over to gold. You pay for your stay here at the inn. And this inn is... This room is crawling with critters and varmints and pests. 
Um, the sheets have not been changed. It is a the lowest place you have quite possibly ever stayed. As you're in this seedy tavern, having never stayed in this part of town before, what would be something each of you would pay attention to before you settle in for a night's of rest? So Sterling um, would be uh, trying to look out the window, kind of get his bearings on where he is, um, looking at the water, just kind of listening. Um, but really, he's thinking to himself, it's better than where we stayed in the woods and the mushroom detect us, and better when uh, where we stayed with the goblins attacked us. So, hey, at least it's a, it's a room. Sterling, you brush aside a um, piece of littered books and out from that, a family of rats scurry away and wrestle into a small little rat hole within deep within the rotten wood of this room. Steeple bottoms? Kind of looks back at you, hisses. Uh, never mind. Hawkins. Uh, in with you know, presuming there's some sort of candle light in the room, um, he'll see to his sort of nightly repairs of his gear, um, fix up a couple of arrowheads for the for the coming day. Um, not paying too much. He, he's occupying his attention with these things, and and so not paying much attention to. Uh, the environment until he is ready to sleep. Vaughn is going to identify um, what it looks like if he had to go out the window and um, and and think about um, how he would get Sterling and Hawkins out of there if they needed to. And once he's identified what that looks like, he's going to go and um, lean on the wall next to the door uh, clear as much furniture away from himself as possible so that uh, he's as far away from the hiding places of all the uh, rodents and and critters as as he can be and then uh, he's going to lean in a way that he's not necessarily back directly on the door but in front of the door so that if somebody was to try to come in it would wake him up and he's going to cash out he's tired each of you take the benefits of a long rest, but Vaughn, you are not entirely suspicious for no good reason. So if you would, make a perception check as you rest through the night. 13. 13, once or twice your senses disturb you as you hear footsteps, but you identify them in a stumbling fashion. Footsteps slowly stop and you hear the collapse of a body the hallway. The smell of alcohol and reeking body odor hits your nose and fills your dreams with visions of stumbling and bumbling drunks moving into a tavern. You also hear the squeaking of rats throughout the night and wake up to the gentle morning light coming through the window. And never before has Twainville been more peaceful than in the early morning during the time of the honest fisherman. With all the low lowlifes passed out and asleep, you hear that gentle hum of hardworking fishers going out for the day. And how do you proceed? Vaughn hearing that, realizing that it sounded a little bit peaceful, would look out the window and observing the scene that you just described. If the others are not awake, he would wake them up and say, uh, Sterling and Hawkins, it, uh, it seems that the riffraff is now sleeping and it would be safer for us to travel now. <laughs> okay. I'll get my things ready. Shouldn't, shouldn't take too long. As you move throughout Twainville, see in your sight now the great river, Sharon, flowing once again towards the Mavi Ocean, you are indeed back to the river. And before you is the Serpent Bridge. This large stone serpent's head comes down off the pillars of the bridge, and what once was a structure of guardianship by the Beholden, a checkpoint on the south southern end of Boshan, set with turrets and 
arrow slits and portcullises and guards, this massive stone bridge spread all the way across the River Sharon, protecting the pe people of Boshan. However, leaving Riverton on the southern side defenseless. And that is why the Riverton Rats established a gang there long ago, whom you recall Otho was once a member of. The Riverton Rats having disbanded and the Bay Knights completely taking over this poor southern town, you can see Riverton far across this mile-wide river. And before the Serpent Bridge, as you press forward, you see that the open street spans 300 feet wide and 60 foot drop off the edge of the bridge, splashing below. You see that there are houseboats having been made and strapped to the bridge, gently floating, where some people have decided to make their domicile. And you see another feature of Boshan, apartments that have been constructed into the stone walls on the sides of the bridge, hanging like shacks. You even see a poor fisher with his nets cast into the water. He's gently making up a hammock that is swinging below the bridge. He hops into a boat and gets to work that day. As you enter into the south entrance, you are looking for the Amber Dune hideout. And what do each of you look for? Vaughn is going to look at Hawkins and Sterling and say, uh, didn't he say that their hideout was in a shop of some sort? Uh, I don't remember which kind. Uh, but aren't those shops right over there? Yeah, that, that's right. Just keep keep your nose open. It's potpourri and tobacco. That's what we're looking for. And the, and the big red A is a bit of a dead giveaway, but we'll see. Um, and Hawkins? Yeah, looking for that. Looking for that A, following his nose. As you step onto the Servant Bridge, a young girl approaches. She looks like she's from Riverton with bare feet, dirt on her face. She runs up to one of you, Hawkins, being just about her size. She quickly runs up to you and then seeing that you are a gnome, she backs away, but in her hand is a pamphlet, a simple pamphlet. And she says with a shaking voice, would you like to buy a pamphlet for a copper? Well, sure, pull out a copper in exchange. She quickly takes the copper and rushes off to her next entrepreneurial endeavor. And on the pamphlet, hastily scrawn as if just this morning says, warning traveler, beware of danger from the skies. <laughs> Looks like there's some kind of, something's expected from the skies. Maybe we should keep one eye up while we're keeping one eye out. Hawkins, as you keep one eye out, roll a d10. 10. Hawkins, you're moving through a busy part of this area. One of the shops you first see is the Constrict Inn. This Constrict Inn, a uh, nicer tavern than the one you stayed at last night. If you had just pursued a little bit farther, you would have seen it. It displays the shrine of an old folk legend of Dindar, the Night Serpent. Patrons who want to protect themselves from the serpent's bite and secure their soul for one day when Dindar will eat the entire plain of Bonsarol in a blink of an eye to guarantee your place in the afterlife and to avoid bad luck. Many patrons are putting their coins in this constricted shrine of a snake. You see a man just quickly walk by and put his coin in through the snake's mouth beyond the forked tongue and the fanged teeth. And a woman steps out of the constrict in. You recognize her, Alexandria whom you delivered, Fletcher, in the custody of her caring hands. She looks busy, her sleeves are rolled up. She puts her hair back in a braid and then looks left and right, waits a little bit, puts a coin into the serpent's mouth, and she walks towards Twinville. How do you respond? Um, Hawkins will say to the guys, wait here just a minute, and he'll walk over to intercept her and say, Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, she looks down. Can I help you? You seem familiar to me. I I think I may have met you uh, maybe a little over a year ago. <laughs> she blushes a little bit. I 
meet many people, my friend, and then she shows you the tattoo of the fortune teller. I read men their fortunes when they're on their last rope. I assume that if we had a dealing, then I hope that the fortune came true and was beneficial for your life. If you are looking for a refund, I'm afraid I don't offer it. No, it's it's nothing like that. Um, on the night that Boshin started to burn, um, I came to your doorstep with a friend who was in trouble, and I and I asked for you to help him. She immediately recognized you. Yes, oh, <laughs> Hawkins and Fletcher. Yeah, of course. Um, are you asking about the welfare of your friend? Yeah, I haven't seen him. I haven't heard anything from him since that night. Well, it wasn't soon after I was able to find his family. Um, his behavior was got worse, much, much worse after you left. He was going on about war and prophecy and the end of the road. It was something bizarre like I've never seen. I got him to his family. Uh, well, they said that they were family and they promised to take him away to a country convalescence. As far as I know, he is there and hopefully recovered. She looks at you and says, it's not often I meet someone who would care for a friend of that nature. I am not often brought people and paid and, and supplemented for their safety. I could do a divination for you for free if you would care to know of his health and safety. I, I would, I think that'd be, that'd be wonderful. A private place, it, it's not too difficult. Um, do you see anywhere where we could just meet face to face outside of the city, the road? Uh, Hawkins recalls an alley that he walked by earlier on the way from, from the CD tavern. He gestures okay. back to the guy saying like, it's okay, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Alexandria leads you away and begins to perform the divination to discover the happenings of Fletcher. In the meantime, Sterling and Vaughn, how do you respond? See, Vaughn, it's not just me that makes new friends. It's everybody, really. It's just not you. I've missed you so much, Sterling. Well, you read that pamphlet, right, about watch up, you know, things coming from above. Well, I, was anything like that in the abyss? I heard that Avernus had all kinds of crazy stuff falling from the sky. We, uh... We saw some crazy little uh, flying demons. That was not fun. I think you might have heard that story. Uh, hopefully Hawkins didn't share too much because it was quite unbecoming of me. Yeah, you came undone all right, mate. Yes, it was not a fun place, Sterling. I, I don't know what would have been worse to be there or be stuck in that room for three days with that uh, demon guy. It's a half demon, mate. He was half good. Yeah, he didn't seem half good to me. But yeah, Sterling is mostly just looking around people's lips, trying to see kind of uh, what's going on where like the people are hushing or people are kind of being shady and stuffing things in their cloaks and running away. Vaughn's looking up, Vaughn's looking out. He's he's keeping a close eye on Hawkins, um, just keeping track of his surroundings, making sure that uh, they don't get ambushed. And all at the same time, trying to keep his face not so obvious because he's well aware that people are looking for him trying to stay less obvious knowing that this could be a big problem yeah doing a little vogue all these things the both of you are standing outside of dolores's cafe and dispensary you see alchemical regents pharmaceutical goods for healing potion making and poison brewing there's also a delightful hot brew that is made inside um, many people are sitting outside enjoying and for a moment Vaughn you get a feeling of sophistication and peace that you once knew in the upper city outside the shop. Sterling I think they have a drink in here that I think you might not have tried before would uh, would you like one? Oh yeah that sounds nice mate I uh, can't believe you actually want to be seen with me this is this is progress I like this. Oh I didn't say I wanted to be seen with you I just am standing here with you and I'm going to have a hot drink so I offered to have get you one. I'll be right back. No, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Why don't you stay here and keep an eye on uh, Hawkins? Uh, or you can go buy the drinks and I'll keep an eye on Hawkins. I don't want to lose track of him. 
Uh, I tend to talk too much to people and get a little too involved in daughters and things like that. I think you go inside. I'll keep my hand on my star glass. Keep an eye on Hawkins. I promise I won't talk to anybody. This seems like the best idea. Sterling, as you're keeping a lookout outside, uh, Hawkins seems to be doing just fine. Vaughn is standing in line. You see a henfolk woman with sandy red hair and a blue bonnet. She is rushing like her life depends on it. And she heads into a shop. And as she passes by, I would like you to make a perception check. With two discoveries to make, you're going for a 10 or higher to gain both. 21. Okay. She smells distinctly of tobacco and potpourri. She also smells a little bit like a wet dog. An odd mixture of aromas. Sterling, having been young and inexperienced in the world, would not know why she smells like wet dog, but would know why she smells like tobacco and potpourri. This all occurs. Welcome, Sojourners. Please take the time to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and share with a friend. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can always visit us on Patreon at Sojourners Awake. I wonder if Sterling will follow after this henfolk woman. And so for now, our story continues. Meanwhile, Hawkins, Alexandria is sitting across from you, and as her hands are laid out, she says, um, put your hands in mine. Yes. Her skin begins to glow, and you see beneath her white, pale skin, Her veins appear as if streams of rivers are flowing beneath her skin. Her eyes flash as blue as the Mavi Ocean. And she begins to chant a sound that sounds like bubbling water overflowing on a stove, hissing then upon the hot stones in the hearth. She calls out the name Fletcher. Fletcher. And then she begins to mutter and describe to you, I see a man sitting in a chair, surrounded by a garden. There are flowers. A woman approaches him. She's wearing a maid's skirt. She offers him a spoon, something green in the spoon. He does not lean forward. She puts the spoon in his mouth and he takes the liquid. His eyes stare out to the flowers, but he does not lean forward to the right or left. He does not turn up or down. He just stares. I see figures, small ones, possibly children. They're fuzzy. They're playing in the flowers and someone is scolding them now. They leave. He is still there. The sun begins to set. It's not dark. It's 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 almost there. It's sunset. It's twilight. Someone picks him up. Oh, they have wheels attached to his chair. They push him away. Wheels on a chair. And as she says the word wheels on a chair, she says chair on wheels, as if she's struggling to understand the concept, but still delivering the image into your head. You've had this thought before, wheels on a chair. She pushes him away easily. The door closes and then she gasps and her skin as well as yours is wet with salty ocean water. The room smells like a day at the beach. She takes a breath and says, did you, did you receive the images? Yeah, thank you. They are fading from my mind as quick as they entered yours. I have no memory of what you saw. That is my gift. I hope it was good news. It was good enough. It doesn't sound like he's uh, whole, but it sounds like he has been with family at least and, and not wasn't taken up in the violence. 
and so thank you for helping him thank you i my profession leans me towards people who are usually at the end of their rope in despair and therefore the least amount to think of others so the blessing is all on my end i have met someone who cares for a friend thank you how are your kids doing by the way <laughs> they're fine my um my oldest left he well as all the eldest have left to have joined the military the sons of war we had no choice i didn't want him to go but i was sad i really hope that it does not come to war um, he should be coming home soon but i haven't heard from him the little ones are doing okay well i hope everything's fine with him i i hope it doesn't come to war as well i i wish there was something i could do about that because i know a lot of people are going to get hurt but uh um, unfortunately, my my business is probably going to take me elsewhere. I'm. I've learned that nothing is up to chance. I believe our paths crossed today for a reason. She flashes her eye, and the port on your arm just sizzles with electricity. She backs up, and her hair starts to stand on end, and says, "Something is coming from the skies." Her eyes flash, and she says. We should not be here. You should get to safety. She stands up. Hawkins says to her, get inside. And then without turning to look to see if she does, he runs back to the guys. She heads towards Twainville to get as far away from the bridge as possible. Sterling! Vaughn! It's coming! Every story comes to an ending, so for now we must conclude. Thank you for listening, Sojourners. Your attention will not go unrewarded. And we look forward to continuing this adventure. If you enjoy this background music and ambiance, you should visit Tabletop Audio. You can find them at www.tabletopaudio.com. And take the time to sojourn with us. Visit us on Facebook, Instagram, and now on Patreon. You can also subscribe to my newsletter at Substack. However you choose to sojourn with us, as always, may your story continue. Thank you.